Thank you for checking out Coastal Community Church. We hope that you receive hope and encouragement through this week's message. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, please share your story at mystory@coastalcommunity.tv. We hope you enjoy the service. What's up, 1150? How y'all doing this evening? That's afternoon. I keep feeling like it's night or something. I, that hour of sleep missing. Anybody else missing that hour of sleep right now? I, I'm telling you what, I'm, I, I'm missing that hour right now. But we're glad that you're here. We're glad you made it out today. Uh, it's an exciting day at, at our church. I, I just want to give you uh, a couple of updates before we kind of dive in today. Uh, first thing is, is a lot of people have been asking, like, what happened Thursday night? Thursday night, we had a huge meeting with the city of Parkland for our future building project, our immeasurably more building project, which we'll be doing an offering at the end of this service for. And so I hope you're, you're prepared for that. Uh, but what happened on Thursday night is we went before uh, one, for one of the commission boards and uh, they were, what was really cool is, is that our master site plan as a whole plan uh, got approved unanimously by the board. So that was really, really awesome that that happened. Uh, yeah, that's a good thing. What wasn't quite as good of a thing is, is uh, our, our community appearance, the appearance of our building application uh, did not get approved uh, uh, at all, uh, partly because when we went before them, our building was designed to look nothing like anything in Parkland uh, uh, on purpose because our church is nothing like anything in Parkland. And so uh, we, we, we had some discussion with them. And uh, what was really amazing is, is that while we couldn't agree in that meeting, they did something they've never done before. They've set up a special meeting for us so that we could come back before them, make some tweaks, uh, not lose who we are in the process, but conform a little bit to the city. And uh, they made a special meeting so we could come back and stay on track to be able to break ground this summer and be able to move forward on our construction project. And so is a is a great, great meeting. In fact, after the meeting, we were out front and they had a, additional meetings. Uh, some of the commissioners were coming out and they stopped me and shook my hand and said, hey, we want you to know that we are super excited about this project. We're, our community needs your church. We want your church here. And so people are ready for your church to be here. So just know that this is something that's going to happen. And so although that was huge by them, they didn't have to say that. They didn't need to say that. But they wanted to communicate to us that this is something that God is definitely leading, that God is definitely guiding. And, and I'm just excited as your pastor to see how he's using our church, both our Coconut Creek campus and the Pompano Beach campus, to reach more people. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen here in the future. Second thing I want to say is, is that this message today is 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 not a complete message. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that God has been working on me personally on uh, this particular message for my own personal life. And, uh, and as God has been working on me, I knew that it was something that I needed to communicate with everybody else. Uh, but because he's not finished with me, like I don't necessarily have it all finished within me, but be able to give out to everybody else, if that makes sense. And so I, I think the best message that's preached is a message that, that God has already done a work in your heart and then is, is using that work to inspire and, and, and do some things in other people's lives. But I'm not there yet. And so I'm going to ask that today you're going to hear my words, but I also want you to see my heart in it. And, and I think that that's an important element for today because you might hear today and you might go, man, that's just not like TJ. That's not the style that he usually goes with or how he communicates or, or this felt a little bit different than normal. Uh, it's partly because God has been convicting me so big in my own life that uh, my conviction might sound like condemnation and that's not my intent. That's why I said I want you to hear my heart. Uh, not necessarily my words all the time, it, particularly for this Sunday, because this is something that God's working on me on. And, and so it started really uh, 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 about a month ago uh, with this song, Jack and Diane. 
uh, I've actually done more funerals uh, this year than I did all of last year already. Uh, which as a pastor is a really, really depressing thing because that means like people are dying, things are not going well uh, for a lot of families. They're going through some grieving processes. But I was doing this funeral back in Bradenton, which I've done multiple funerals back in Bradenton where, I'm, where I, my wife and I moved from this year. And as we were driving back from a particular funeral, I was trying to figure out what is the last week of this Face the Music series? Like, God, what do you want to speak to our church, like I, like I want, I don't want to just do something canned. I don't want to do something simple. Like God, I really want you to speak through this series of messages, and I, I believe that the music that we hear all the time, you have something to say through it. And I heard this song on the radio, Jack and Diane, uh, by John Mellencamp, and there was a, a particular line in it that just kind of hit me really, really hard. It says, "Oh yeah, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone." And when I heard that line, it was like, boom, God hit me. And, and he goes, yeah, like we don't realize the significance of those words. Oh, yeah, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone. There is a thrill to living this life. There is a thrill to maximizing this life. There is a thrill that comes along with it. But what we fail to realize in this life is that there's a whole nother life that follows. It's called eternity. And a lot of times we miss out on living this life with perspective of the next life. And we, we have a very, very limited view of it. And, and, and so I really felt like God was like, hey, we need to talk about having the right perspective when it comes to eternity, when it comes to living this life and making the most of this life here on earth so we can make the most of the next life with eternity with God. And so let me explain it like this. I've gotten to travel all over the world. Uh, I, I don't say that to boast because honestly, I don't really like traveling. I, if I could choose to never travel again, I would never travel again. I, I hate getting in airplanes. I hate being in foreign countries where I'm not in control of situations. Uh, like it's just not fun for me. But I've gotten to travel all over Asia. I've gotten to travel all over Africa, South America, Central America, throughout Europe. I've gotten the opportunity to do a lot of things over the last 15 or 16 years of my life. Life. And every time I'm on a trip, the thing that I'm most excited about when I'm on a trip is the moment that I'm going to get home. God's honest truth. And the reason why I'm more excited to get home than to do anything else is because the thing that I love the most is at my home. It's my wife. And so while it's really awesome to go to Asia and explore in China or the Philippines or, or Indonesia or to be in Africa and see what God is doing through our work and to Belisha and see the impact that we're having in the next generation through our care points, while that's great, every time I'm in those places, I'm counting down the hours and the days to the moment I can get home and love on my wife because that is the most important thing in my life here on this earth. My most important earthly thing is the relationship I have physically with my wife. It's, it's, it's what I long for. It's what I live for. And I say that because the same thing should be true with us in our relationship with God. While we look at this life, this life is a limited life. And the goal at the end of this life is that we're going to get to encounter the one that we love with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And so we should be here living right now like we're on vacation, waiting for the moment, counting down the time till we get to meet and experience the love of our life, Jesus Christ. Like that should be the, the, with the kind of way we live, with that kind of anticipation. Man, I can't wait for that moment. This prayer is good. Uh, it's, like, it's like when I'm away, like calling Shayla is awesome. Doing some FaceTime is good. But it's nothing like getting there to be with her physically. The same thing is true here. Like this is awesome. It's awesome to come together and worship here. But I cannot wait for the moment when I get to the end of my life and I get to experience Jesus face to face. Like that is the ultimate of what I'm going after in this life. And, and while I love Jesus with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind and all of my strength, and I can't wait for that moment, like I profess that love while I'm here on this earth, I've found that there are a lot of other things that start to gain my affection, that start to gain my attention, that start to gain my love. There are a lot of other things that start to 
replace this love that I have for God in things that, that aren't bad things. They're, they're, they're decent things. They're good things. And, and all of a sudden, my affection starts to build for those, and my affection for God starts to lessen. And I think the reason that that happens in my life, and I'm going to guess that it probably happens in your life as well, is because for a lot of us, what happens to us is we think so much about right now instead of later on in life. We get so focused on the here and the now of life that we forget that there is a later thing that is going to take place. It's kind of like when I'm driving down US 1 on my way to a coffee shop in, in Fort Lauderdale, and, and I'll be driving down US 1, and on my right will be a Krispy Kreme with a hot and ready sign. And like all I think about is the here right now, and I think, man, how many donuts can I eat? And I already know the answer is 12. And so I stop there, and I eat 12 donuts, and, and I'm like, man, this is awesome right now. <laughs> like that's a spiritual experience right there. What we don't think about is later, like when we got to work those donuts off, like when we stand in front of the mirror and we're like, why did I eat those donuts? You know, like we don't think about that. Why? Because we're focused on right now. Same thing is true. Like my wife loves to go window shopping. Nothing is greater than her than spending time together walking around the Sawgrass Mills Mall. It's like going on a missions trip, I promise you. It's like you can experience every diversity of culture in one place in South Florida. And we'll go there and we'll look around and all of a sudden I'll see a pair of shoes that I'm like, man, I got to have those right now. Like that'll, that'll be a game changer to my wardrobe that match my blazer. That's awesome. I got to have them. And I buy them and I don't think about later when I have to pay for them at the end of the month when I got to pay all my other bills. Or some of us, we, we think, man, I'm going to have a good time tonight. I'm going to live it up. Like, it's going to party like it's 1999. Like, we're going to do prints all over again. And we're going to go, and we're going to live it up, and we're going to max out the night. We're going to have a blast, and we're going to drink, and we're going to have fun. And we live it up in the now, never thinking about later the next morning when you're going to wake up with a hangover. And it's in that moment you wish, oh, man, why didn't I do something differently? Because we live in the now instead of thinking about the later. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 is talking to a group of people that have very much lived in the now, and, and, and he's encouraging them to live a little bit differently. He's encouraging them to get some different perspective because proper perspective changes things in life. And he's saying, listen, there's a lot of things you can live for, but there's something that is so much greater than right now. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, he says this, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things. He's like, listen, I haven't got this all figured out. I'm not all that in a bag of chips at the moment. He goes, or that I've already reached perfection. Like, I haven't conquered this completely. He says, but the thing I do is I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I'm focused on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. See, Paul's whole focus on his life was not this right now moment because right now, if you were to look and understand where he's talking from, he's actually chained up in prison. He could have been so focusing on the right here and the right now. He could have been focused on the difficulties of life. He could have been focused on what was happening all around him. But he says, man, I'm not focusing on any of that stuff. What I'm focusing on is the one thing that matters. I'm focusing on my relationship with God and all that I have and with all that I am. The one thing that I want to possess is Christ. And man, so my focus, my attention, everything that I have is going to be on him. And it's interesting because we come to church on Sunday and we sing songs about resur this resurrecting king and, and spending eternity with God and worshiping him and how he's the God of immeasurably more, trying to get us to focus for just a moment in the busyness of our lives on God. And Paul's going, what else is there to focus on? Like that should be the only, it shouldn't just be this momentary thing that we, we come to and we get for 15, 20, 30 minutes a, a week, but it should be something that is our attention is fixed on continuously. In fact, just a little bit earlier in this passage, he says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I read statements like that, and I'm like, Paul, you're confused. Like, to, to die is probably go to see Christ. He's like, no, no, no. To die means that, man, I've gained everything that I wanted in life because that's where I meet my creator. To live means that I focus on Christ and I exemplify him to everybody else. 
And I'm, I'm going to look and I'm going to live for that moment. Because this right here, this is all temporary. This is all subject to change at any moment. But that right there, that's my home. That's the place that I long for. That's the place that I want. And he's encouraging us, don't focus on all this stuff right now. This is distractions in life. Keep your attention there. He said one of the reasons that he, we put our attention there is because we are not perfect right now. Anybody else sick and tired of being imperfect? Anybody else? I, I, I'm sick and tired of being imperfect. I'm sick and tired of you being imperfect. Like, I'd like for you to hurry up and perfect yourselves because you want to know why? I'm tired of screwing up on the same things over and over again. Like, I'm tired of the fact that when I drive by Krispy Kreme, somehow my car just gets in there and I eat those. You know, like, I don't understand that. Like, why does my navigation take me there every time? Like, there's something imperfect in that system. And the imperfection in there is me. Like, I can't wait for that. But the reason I can't wait for that is because then it'll be so much easier. I don't know about you, but I would like for life to be easier. I like life to be a little bit more simple. I like life to be a little bit more comfortable. Anybody like their life to be a little bit more comfortable? A couple of us. The rest of us are lying. <laughs> like, I've never met anybody that's like, man, you know what I would really like, Pastor TJ? I would just like for my life to just get really, really hard. <laughs> Do you think that God could just make my life more difficult? Like, that, that's never been a conversation that I've had. Want to know why? Because we all love comfort. There isn't a single person in here that doesn't love comfort. And, and, and I love comfort. I love things that are comforting. I love things that bring comfort to my comfort. My favorite thing that brings comfort to my comfort is comfort food. Come on now. Can I get an amen right there? Comfort food. Comfort food will change your life. Southern comfort food will change your life. My favorite, my favorite comfort food is biscuits. Oh, yeah, that, I just spoke somebody's love language right there. <laughs> Biscuits say I love you for years and years. There's nothing better than going to Cracker Barrel and getting some biscuits. That is comforting right there. And, and listen, you got to get your biscuits done right. Like, because like, there's, there's good biscuits and there's bad biscuits. Ba the bad biscuits... Are, are the ones that aren't flaky. You need the biscuits that are flaky. You know what I'm saying? Like they flake off in layers. Like that's a good biscuit right there. And how you make a biscuit amazing is, is you get some butter and you get some honey and you put you break that biscuit open. You, you see the steam rising off that biscuit. You, you get the aroma of that biscuit in your nostrils and then you load it with honey and butter. And then you slap that biscuit back together. And you let it marinate. Come on now. That right there. You let that sit for 10, 15 minutes. You let that butter soak into that biscuit. You let that honey start running through. Like you want that biscuit to be so soggy that you can just drink the biscuit. I mean, that's like, just like slide down your throat. Okay, we can just end service and go get biscuits now. I'm just like... Man, you go to Cracker Barrel because that's the best place for biscuits. You go get, I remember we were, at, we were at Cracker Barrel this one time and we got some biscuits and, and, and we got breakfast. And, and I'm one of those guys that I prep my biscuits for later. So the first thing I do is I break the biscuit open. I get like four sticks of that really hard butter, throw it on there because I know it'll melt it, load it down with honey, set it there, put it right to the side of my plate. And then I devour my plate because you always save the biscuit for the end. The best bite at the end. That's the rule for being a foodie. You always save the best taste for the very last bite because that's what you want to remember. That's what you want to leave with. That's what you want to experience because that's what's going to keep you coming back for more biscuits, okay? And so, and so I set it up. I, I'm eating my breakfast because I get breakfast at Cracker Barrel. I don't get anything else at breakfast at Cracker Barrel. I'm eating my breakfast. Shayla's there with me. I consume my food. I'm not paying attention to anything else because it's all about food in that moment. I just want the food in my belly. I finish, I look up, I go to reach for my biscuit, and my biscuit is gone. That is a bad day right there. I call the biscuit police, and I'm like, where is my freaking biscuit? 
I wanted to stand up in the restaurant. Who stole my biscuit? I look, I look over across to Shayla. I'm like, Shayla, have you seen my biscuit? This is a normal conversation for us. She's like, no, I don't see your biscuit. I'm like, what do you mean you don't? Where, where did my biscuit go? Oh, where did my biscuit? Oh, I ate it. You what? It's my biscuit. It's going to make me feel good about myself. She's like, you can get over that. I was like, I was like, oh, no, you didn't. And I just did the, this thing. No, I didn't do that, but I wanted to. I really wanted to murder her in that moment. I mean, that's how much I wanted that biscuit. Like, I like food that much. I didn't. It's because it's comforting to me. If food is comforting to you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for a long time, I thought the purpose of my life was to be comfortable. Like God just wants me to be comfortable. And I'm here to tell you today, the purpose of your life is to not be comfortable. A lot of us think, man, I, God, God wants me to be comfortable. No, no, no. God wants you to have character, and character is never built in comfort. God wants you to become more and more like him. And you don't become more and more like him by being comfortable. What I found is when I'm comfortable, I do less and less and less. And a lot of us, we think that this life is all about, like, how can I make this life easy and coast and comfortable? And God's not about that really at all. In fact, Paul continues on in, in, in verse 14, he says, I press on. He says, forgetting what is behind me, I strain and I press on to reach the end of the race and receive a heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. He uses this imagery of like, man, we've got to press on. And he's, he's talking about the fact that, that we are in a race and when you're running in a race, the one thing you don't ever want to do in a race is you don't want to get distracted by what's around you. In fact, in most races, they tell you if you're running, don't ever look to see where another runner is. Because in that split second that you look back, it slows you down, it gets you off track, it gets you off pace, and that's typically where people lose the race. He's saying, listen, your focus doesn't need to be on the distractions and the comforts of this world. It's easy to allow those to become your primary, but that shouldn't be your primary in life. The primary thing you should be focusing on is you should be pressing on to the finish line. The focus of your life should be the finish line where you cross the line of faith and encounter this God that you love with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. That should be your priority. And Paul's not the only one to talk about this. In fact, Jesus talks about this very thing. In fact, in, Mark, in Luke chapter 9, he says this. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. He said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, let me first return home and bury my father. And Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said to him, anyone who puts his hand in the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Like, dang, anybody who goes, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to start working and going after you and, and turns a little bit to the side. You say that they are completely unfit. That is harsh. Some of you think that I'm harsh. Listen, I'm just learning from Jesus. I mean, think about the statements that he made right there. He tells somebody, hey, follow me. And they're like, man, uh, Jesus, I want to follow you. I, I, I want to do that. Listen, my dad just died. He's like, I don't give a rip that your dad just died. Let somebody else that's dead bury them. Your job is to move forward and preach the gospel and make a difference for eternity. Wow, really? Really? Says to another person, follow me. Okay, look, can, I, can I say goodbye to my family? No. You know, ain't nobody got time for that. We're on mission here. 
Like, don't focus on those comforts. And that's, that's pretty extreme when you think about that. And I look at my life and the life that I've built in South Florida, and I like my life. I do. I, I love the comforts that I've come up with in my home. I love the vehicle that I drive. I love the lifestyle that I've acquired. I like the easiness of those things. And Paul's saying, man, it's easy to get focused on those. But don't focus on it. Focus straight ahead. And honestly, I struggle with it because I love comfort. I really do. I'm going to guess you probably love comfort too. Like there is nothing better than going home and laying down on my pillow top mattress and just sinking into that place of comfort and it hugging me back. I'm telling you, single people, you don't need a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You just need a pillow top mattress. It will hug you. You'll feel embraced. I love it. And honestly, I'm constantly looking at how do I make my life more comfortable. And Paul is going, TJ, you've got to press on to the end of the race. Don't get veered off to the left. Don't get veered off the right. Man, you've got to run in such a way that, that your sole focus isn't on comfort, but it's on that finish line. We are running and you're straining. And listen, along the way, there's going to be water stations and it's really easy because you're running so hard and you're working so hard and you're so focused on that to go, man, I just need a cup of water. And you go over there to that water station. If you ever ran a race, they're always there. That There's some water there. And a lot of times there's some energy snacks and, and you can grab them real quick. And, and a lot of times, I know for me, when I've been in those races, I'll grab a cup of water and I'll drink it and I'll go, well, I can use a second cup of water and I'll drink that. And before long, I'm, I'm sitting down in somebody's chair eating snacks. Why? Because that's way more comfortable than it is pressing on to run the race. And I just naturally veer towards comfort. And he's going, no, 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 no. You got to keep pressing on to the end. You got to focus on Jesus and what's ahead. Instead of looking behind you, focus on what's ahead. The question is, is how many of us really live that way? Looking at the end. Living our life for the end. See, what I've discovered in life is that everything that I do in this life is going to bring me reward or it's going to bring me regret. It's only two options. Every decision that I make always has a ramification. It's either going to bring reward to my life or it's going to bring regret to my life. And a lot of us, what we do is we look at life and we look at the decisions that we make for the here and now and we feel like, man, this is a great reward right now because I achieve comfort. Like we think that that is a reward. The problem is, is that in the grand scheme of things, most of the things that we comfort ourselves with, we don't remember and we regret those decisions later. Let's, let's, and if we took a different perspective, we would start to see that if we had a perspective of I'm going to run my race like I'm running and living for getting to this end, to the one that I love, it would change everything. Because you would look at your life and say you had $1,000. You'd go, man, I could do a lot of things right now that would comfort me with that $1,000. I could, I could buy this. I could experience that. And that would bring some comfort to my life. But in, if when I get before God in heaven and he goes, hey, how did you spend that $1,000? How I spent that is either going to bring reward from him or it's going to bring regret. Doesn't matter. We can, we can throw something different. We can look at our time. Maybe you've got time on your hands right now and you're like, man, this week I've got some days off and, and I've got a choice. I can do a Netflix marathon. 
And someday we're going to stand before Jesus and that decision to do a Netflix marathon is going to bring reward or it's going to bring regret to our life. And Paul was saying, man, you've got to think about the future, not my current comfort. And, and let me illustrate it this way. Uh, this is Francis Chan uh, did this illustration and uh, thank you to him for a brilliant idea. This, this rope right here represents your existence. And uh, your existence, I mean, it goes on and on and on long after the thrill of living is gone. And so you're, you're going to exist for all of eternity in life. There is a, a long time in this existence. Now, your existence here on earth is represented by this red part. But you're going to live for a really, really long time. Long after the thrill of living is gone is this second part of life. The problem is, is so many of us, we're focused on this rent section. We are consumed by this. We think that this is all that there is, and, and we work, and we work, and we work, and we work, and we strive, and we, and, and we think to ourselves, at some point, at some point, right about here, I'm going to have enough time, I'm going to have enough money, I'm going to have enough resources, that I'm going to be able to vacation where I want to vacation, I'm going to be able to go out to dinner whenever I want to go out to dinner, I'm going to be able to travel anywhere I want to go, and I'm going to be able to maximize this life like I've always dreamed that I could do. And I look at people that live this way, and I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, seriously, are you kidding me? You're going to do all of this to live for this moment and disregard all of this. Disregard all of this. All this time that's going to come after this small, minute time here on earth. Why on earth will we spend all of our time trying to make ourselves as comfortable as as comfortable as possible for this little bit when we got all this time to be comfortable. Like, why would we do that? And that's why Paul is going, man, we got to press on. We got to keep our focus on the very end. We can't get so consumed in the comforts of life that we disregard the eternity that's going to come behind us. What's interesting to me is I, I, I've had so much, many of my family go, TJ, do you realize that the decisions that you and Shayla are making right now, I mean, that's going to impact your savings account. That's going to impact your retirement. That's going to impact this. And, and, and they're like, you're so stupid to do that. And I'm like, you're the one who's stupid because you're living all this way and you're not regarding this at all. Like, you're the one that's crazy. Because you've got such a limited view and perspective. See, I've realized that this life, I've only got one chance at it. I only got one chance at this life. I don't get a do-over. I don't get a repeat. I don't get a start-over. I got one shot. And what I do in that moment is going to determine whether I live with reward or regret in this life. Because all of us are going to end up somewhere in eternity. And what we, our life looks like in eternity is determined by what we do right now in this existence. And everybody lives for this red part. And we live in this deception thinking that this is all that there is because this is what we see all around us. And Paul's going, don't be deceived. Don't think this is all that there is because there is so much more. So how do we live like we only got one chance to live? How do we live? And, and Paul really gives us some application here. In verse 17, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I've told you often before, and I say it again, with tears in my eyes, there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ and they are headed for destruction. But their God is their appetite and they brag about shameful things. They think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. Paul goes, you want to know how you should live to maximize this life? Here's what you do. You imitate how I'm living. 
you live your life the same way that I live my life, not focused on the here and the now and the distractions and the comfort of this life, but focusing on that moment that I'm going to encounter God. That has got to be the focus. That has got to be the perspective. That has got to be everything in your life. He says, how you do that is you keep your eyes focused on those who walk the walk, don't talk the talk. Because listen, there's a lot of people who talk a good game about their faith, but very few that actually walk that game out. He says, be an imitator of the people that are walking it out. Because listen, inside this room, there are two types of professing believers. There are those that are worthy to be imitated and those that are not. There are those that are worth following with your life, with your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, going like, man, I'm going to live my life just like that person is. And then there's people that, that they're just not worth following. They might talk a good game, but their walk doesn't follow their talk. And honestly, I'm just tired of talk. Well, TJ, how do you know the difference? Here's how you tell the difference. Their appetites... What drives them in life will show you what they value most in their life. If their time, their talent, their treasure are following things that are bettering just for them and for their sake and for their comfort. He said, those are probably people that aren't worth following. And what's, what's so crazy is, is that's exactly what our world tells us to follow. It's the exact opposite of what God says we should follow. He goes, listen, there's only a couple people I can point out that I can say, Paul saying this, I can only, there's, there's Timothy, there's, there's Aphrodite, there's, there's a couple people that are worth following. A couple weeks ago, right after uh, David Payne had come here to speak, um, right in the middle of the series, I was at dinner with with a group of people and I was sitting next to one of our elders and uh, what I love about being around this guy, this guy is just full of so much life. He and his wife are incredible, incredible people. And and we got there, we're sitting at this dinner and and basically he and I get in a conversation. We don't really talk to anybody else the entire night. We just talk to each other. And uh, like some of the most life-giving talk you can encounter. I mean, we just laugh, we crack up. and, And during the middle of it, he goes, hey, Hey, and he grabs me, and he goes, hey, I want you to know something. God rocked my world this weekend. I was like, really? Tell me about that. He goes, man, when David was talking, he was talking about how, how there's a miracle that, that needs to happen. And most of the time, we don't think we can play our part in the miracle, but we don't have to have everything for the miracle. We just have to give what's in our hand for the miracle to take place. Jesus is the one that does the miracle. We just give him what we have, and then he produces the miracle. And I was sitting there with my wife. He goes, TJ, I've been saving up for for like two years to buy a computer because I've wanted this specific computer, and it's incredible. And I'm sitting there, and I look over at my wife, and I go, babe, we're not buying a computer. I go, why aren't you buying a computer? And he goes, because that's what's in my hand. Somebody else's miracle is sitting in my hand right now. And as much as I want a computer, what I really want in life, TJ, is I want people's lives to be transformed by the gospel. And while that would be awesome and that would be comfortable and that would be great for our house, what would be greater is if we could change lives. And I walked away from that dinner, and that just sat with me. And I was wrestling with it because here's a God that I'm so, so thankful for that would lead our church from the front line saying, hey, this is how we're supposed to live. And God goes, you know what? That's a God you need to imitate, TJ. TJ. He started convicting me and he started working on my heart. In fact, I was texting my wife on that, like a couple days later, I'm like, I was sitting there studying for this week, which is a couple weeks away, and I was like, man, I'm so convicted. Because I've got stuff in my hand that I'm thinking about for my comfort rather than the end in mind. I told my wife, I said, I think we're supposed to sacrifice even more than we have. She goes, 
that's going to cause us to have to change some of our lifestyle. And I go, exactly. That's what Jesus is after. He's after our life changing completely for him. Then this elder dropped a line on me that I've said so many times to our church, and I, I wanted to punch him in the throat for it because it just like convicted me. It's from an old revivalist named Leonard Ravenhill. He says, The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of that opportunity. See, your life is the, the opportunity of a lifetime. What are you doing to seize it? What are you doing to live in such a way? that the end is in mind? What are you doing to live as somebody that should be imitated rather than just living with a bunch of talk? And my prayer is, is that we would live with the mindset of when I get to heaven are the decisions that I'm making are they with a Jesus mindset? This decision that I'm making today, is that going to reward me when I get to heaven or is that a decision I'm going to regret with my life? Thank you for checking out Coastal Community Church. We hope that you receive hope and encouragement through this week's message. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, please share your story at mystory.coastalcommunity.tv. We hope you enjoy the service.